and to target it for for you guys, patients, family, and caregivers. Um, oops. Um, mm. Give me one second here. We got a technical. Uh, so I have no uh, I have no disclosures. I have no uh, conflicts to report. And uh, I've been to this meeting before, and I know there's food around, so I'm not going to put any surgical images in here. Um, give me one second here. Let's see. Hmm. Okay. So what roles can surgery play with mesothelioma? And there's really three roles. It can be used for diagnosis, it can be used for palliation, or it can be used therapeutically. And I'll go through each of these. <laughs> Diagnostic procedures. Now, this is uh, this is not technically an operation, at least by surgical standards. It's more of what we would call a procedure, but a thoracentesis. And I thought I would just take a, a moment to explain some of this. This is something that my patients often ask about. You know, where the fluid come from, how to come from, because the majority of patients with mesothelioma, pleural mesothelioma, present with shortness of breath and it's related to the fluid accumulating. And if you look at this cartoon on the left here, can you guys see my, my arrow moving? Is that yes. visible? Yes, we can. Great, so this cartoon shows the, the chest cavity and basically humans have two separate spaces. So you have the, and the, the way it's oriented, at least in this country, is that the patient is facing you. So this would be the right side this is the left side, this is the left lung, this is the right lung, and this is a pleural effusion, just meaning that there's fluid in this pleural space. And in humans, these two sides are separate. I'm often asked, why didn't the fluid go from one side to the other? Uh, and it's just in the one side. Every day, a couple of cups of fluid come out of the lungs and get absorbed by the lining of the chest cavity, primarily along the diaphragm here, which is down at the bottom. And anything that throws that balance out, so at any given time, though, it's like a stream. At any given time, there's only maybe a few teaspoons of fluid in the pleural space. But if something throws that balance out of whack, it could be too much fluid to absorb. So the most common probably being congestive heart failure, or if you have a pneumonia and the lung is kind of weeping fluid, it's too much to absorb, you'll build up the effusion. That's kind of like the... Um, the snow melt, melting in the mountains, your stream overflows, you end up with a lake. With mesothelioma, it's really the cancer kind of plugs up these little holes here where the fluid gets absorbed and that fluid accumulates. So it's like putting up a dam, your, your stream overflows and you end up with a lake. So that's how you get these pleural effusions. This x-ray in the middle shows this, again, patients facing you. So this is the right lung and the x-rays go through the air easily so it looks black. Uh, this is the left lung is all squashed down here and all this, the diaphragm should be down here. This should all be black, but that's all fluid. And so when you do a thoracentesis, you basically just put a needle in there and you suck that fluid out. And that's what you can see in this cartoon over here. Um, that can give you a diagnosis. Now, what I'll tell you is interesting is that only about 60% of the time, so just a little better than a coin toss, if a cancer is causing the pleural effusion, only about 60% of the time do the cells actually end up in the fluid. So it's, it's fairly common for patients to present saying, geez, you know, uh, they didn't see any cancer in the fluid. And that unfortunately is common up to 40% of the time. And so that's the diagnostic limitations. The other thing is that a thoracentesis, although it will provide initial relief, and that's that's absolutely the appropriate thing to do when someone presents with fluid and you send it off for all the tests, that fluid is gonna reaccumulate in the overwhelming majority of the time. So it may only last a few days, it may last a week or two, but uh, it's not a permanent solution because like I said, it's like a stream and it keeps kind of overflowing and you'll build up this fluid here. The thing, the smallest thing that can be done, the smallest procedure that can be done to give a diagnosis, a real diagnosis, be a core needle biopsy. This CT scan shows basically this is a lung nodule. The patient's actually lying face down. This is the spine in the back here. So this is their back is up and they're putting, you can see on the CAT scanner, 
they're using that to guide the placement of this needle. And if you look over here, this is, they're kind of these fancy needles. It's got this, this is the needle on the inside and this, this is a sheath on the outside. So you put this needle through the nodule here and then you close this down and it gets a little sliver of tissue that you can actually look at. So it's not just what we call cytology, which is up here when you send that fluid, it's just the cells that are floating, floating free in the fluid. Here you actually have a small sliver of tissue. So that's the smallest thing that can give you an actual diagnosis. And I'll tell you why that's important is that um, for surgery especially, there's several, as most of you probably know, there's several subtypes of mesothelioma. There's an epithelioid subtype, there's a sarcomatoid subtype, and there's what we call biphasic or mixed, which has elements of both. And whether or not, what subtype it is can guide whether or not surgery is appropriate. And I'll talk about that a little more later. But now it's also appearing that the subtype can influence the appropriate type of systemic therapy, whether you get immunotherapy or chemotherapy or a combination. So the subtype is important. And of those two types of cells, the epithelioid cells or the sarcomatoid cells, only the epithelioid cells actually shed into the fluid. So you can have a biphasic cancer, meaning that you have the sarcomatoid subtype, which could influence treatment options, but those cells don't show up in the fluid. So a biopsy is strongly encouraged the overwhelming majority of the time. And I would say is actually essential if you're considering surgery as a treatment. The next thing would be a video assisted. Now this I would call an operation, a video assisted thoracoscopic biopsy or VATS is a term that you'll hear. And what that is, now this is a, a picture I lifted off the internet. This is showing a lung cancer operation, but basically the patient's on their side we put a video camera into through one hole, and then we can put these instruments in through the others, and you can do an operation while you're watching on TV with specially designed instruments. When I do this for mesothelioma, the overwhelming majority of the time, you can do it through a one half inch incision, and you can actually, so you can put the, you can make a small incision, you can put a, a suction in alongside a, a video camera, you can drain all the fluid out, and then you can do your biopsies. And the other thing is that this can be combined with palliative procedures at the same time. Uh, and I'll talk about them on the next slide. And then the last thing is for an open surgical biopsy. And what I would tell you is that the ability to do a video procedure means that there's space in the chest cavity that you can put the video camera into and operate. But mesothelioma, although it can often present with a small rind of tumor lining the chest cavity, but there's still fluid, you can put a video camera in and have space. But sometimes you have a thick rind of tumor and there is no space. And in fact, the lung, it's like someone just poured cement into the chest cavity. It's coating the lung and it completely, it's up against the chest wall. And in those cases, what you can do is you can make a small incision and you basically just cut down between the ribs and you can get some biopsies that way. So that's the other way to establish a diagnosis. Uh, I would tell you that if someone is talking to you about doing a major chest operation where they do a regular incision, which can be, I don't know, four, six inches long, uh, that, that I, I would have trouble coming up for an indication to do that. This can almost always be done through a small incision because the lung is already stuck up to the chest cavity, there really is no chance of the lung collapsing. Uh, so you don't even have to put a tube in after the surgery. And this is almost always an outpatient procedure. If I do the video procedure and I, I'll typically leave a tube in there, patients can go home the same day, but often I'll, I'll leave them in overnight just for their own comfort and to kind of help get the drainage kick-started. So speaking of the drainage, the next role for surgery is palliation. And this can be performed as a separate procedure or like I said, combined with the VATS procedure. So if you present with fluid in the chest cavity, like over here, then one of the ways that you can palliate this, you can help with that because you want to keep that lung expanded. Uh, what happens is that if the lung, that fluid in there has a lot of protein another material in it. And if you leave the lung, the lung has the consistency of a sponge. The fluid isn't, isn't, 
is not uh, compressible. So if the fluid accumulates in the chest cavity, the lung gets compressed, and then the fluid can actually, like an, uh, an onion peel, can layer on top of it. So even if you take the fluid out, the lung won't re-expand, and that's called entrapment of the lung. And you wanna avoid that because it makes it harder to breathe, even if you drain the fluid out, uh, it can compromise your quality of life. It can actually make it harder uh, to eat because this fluid, if you think about it, uh, think of this fluid can be up to, you know, two liters even more. If you think of like a two liter bottle of Chet Pepsi in the chest cavity, pressing down on the diaphragm, which is a pliable structure, that pressure can get transmitted to the stomach and actually squash the stomach down. So patients have a symptom we call early satiety, meaning they take a few bites and they feel full. And so draining this fluid out can also help with that. So that's another common presentation of mesothelioma is patients losing weight. They'll say, I just, I can't eat. It's because they feel full all the time. So draining the fluid, this is called a tunneled catheter. This is probably my preferred way to palliate someone with a pleural effusion. You can see this little cuff here. They're all pretty much the same. I think there's different brands. This part here is kind of like a soaker hose. It has a bunch of little holes in it. This is about, I don't know, two thirds the diameter of a, of a pencil. Uh, you know, a little bigger than a phone cord if people, if people have phones with cords anymore. Uh, but it's, uh, it's pretty narrow. It's made out of a squishy material, silicone, so they're pretty comfortable. This part sits under the skin here. This is a little fuzzy cuff that prevents the bacteria from being able to migrate in, so it keeps us from getting infected. And it also anchors the tube. And then this part sits out here and gets curled up underneath the dressing. This is a valve, and so what happens is you put this tube in, it sits in here like this, and then you can see in this cartoon, you connect this, these two together, this is a vacuum bottle, it sucks the fluid out, so this gets sucked out, the lung can re-expand, and that can really help a lot with the fluid, and in fact, if the lung fully re-expands, typically over a few weeks, the lung will stick up to the lining of the chest cavity, the fluid stops draining it, and you can take these out. And to take these out, that's something you can do in the office. The other option to palliate the fluid is a pleurodesis. So at the time of surgery, which you can do, or even uh, just through a tube, you can put in a material in here. You can see the lung over here, and it causes irritation and basically gets the lung to stick up to the lining of the chest cavity, basically gets cemented up there so that the fluid doesn't have any place to get into and it doesn't drain out. What I would tell you is that this can be a good option, but it really is predicated on the lung re-expanding, and it is a mistake to try and do a pleurodesis if the lung doesn't fully expand, because the most common, if the lung isn't pressing up against the lining of the chest cavity, it can't stick there. And the most common material that is used is, believe it or not, talc, which is talcum powder, which is a mineral, and that's a permanent foreign body. The chest is great at clearing infections as long as the lung is fully expanded. But if you have a space and you have this foreign body sitting in there, if that gets infected, that can be a really devastating and challenging problem. So uh, I try and shy away from pleurodesis unless the lung fully expands. So let's move on to the last role of surgery, which is the therapeutic applications of surgery. Um, and let me start with this, and I tell every patient this, surgery is not, I repeat, not the standard of care treatment for mesothelioma. The standard of care treatment for mesothelioma is systemic therapy. So until recently, it was just a combination chemotherapy, pemetrexid or Olympta is a trade name, and a platin drug, cisplatin or carboplatin. Recently, there's been now the immunotherapies which have come into play, and those can be considered standard of care as well. Surgery is not the standard of care. It's an aggressive treatment, which is only appropriate for select patients. Why is that? You can't cure anyone with surgery alone with mesothelioma, and I'll show you why, but let's start with cases where you can cure someone with surgery. So if this is a lung cancer sitting here in this lung and it's completely encapsulated, it's surrounded by all this normal tissue if you take this out and it has not already spread, then you can cure someone of that cancer. You haven't violated the plane of the tumor. There's no cells leaking out. And you have what we call a microscopically complete 
resection, or sometimes in surgery we call it an R0 resection. But basically, you can remove the tumor intact without spilling any cells. Surgery for mesothelioma is a totally different situation. The cancer for mesothelioma coats every surface in the chest cavity. It coats the lining of the chest cavity. It coats the lung. It goes into all the nooks and crannies between the different lobes of the lung. It coats the pericardium, which is the sac around the heart, the diaphragm, your breathing muscle. It's everywhere. And that operation uh, is more analogous to like scraping paint. Uh, and so if you look over here, it's like, gosh, it looks like the guy got everything. But if you look with a microscope at this board, you're going to find a paint chip somewhere. And if that paint chip is a live cancer cell, it's going to multiply and divide. And pretty soon that board is going to be repainted. So the best you can do with surgery for mesothelioma is to remove all of the detectable disease, anything you can see or feel but there's always gonna be microscopic or invisible disease that still remains. That said, there is compelling evidence that highly selected patients can benefit significantly from a surgery-based approach, not just from surgery, but from a surgery-based approach. And when you do surgery, you have to combine it with other treatments. And I will typically always combine it with the standard of care treatment whether that's immunotherapy, chemotherapy, or both. And then we'll even do an intraoperative treatment. So once the cancer is out, we'll do an intraoperative treatment to try and kill the residual or microscopic disease that you know is still there. But you have to combine surgery with the other treatments. Highly selected patients um, is, is still a little bit more art than science because who those patients are is not dictated. Most cancers, almost all cancers are treated by what's called the staging system. And so for instance, with this lung cancer, this would be a stage one lung cancer. We know black and white from hundreds of thousands of patients that surgery is the gold standard best treatment for that because depending on the size and so forth, we could tell you there's a 70 or 80 or even 90% chance of cure rate. We don't have a staging system currently with mesotheliomas that predictive. And one of the reasons is, like I was saying before, the subtype is so important. And for instance, the epithelioid subtype is the type that is most responsive to a surgery-based approach. That subtype is not currently in the staging system. We're revising the staging system, and I am hope we get this into it. But picking out the patients who are going to be most appropriate for surgery is still a bit of an art form. There are two ways. Again, the goal is to remove all of the detectable disease. Uh, and there's two ways you can do it. You can either take the lung out or you can spare the lung. So in this cartoon over here, you can see the mesothelioma coating all those surfaces. Here it is along the diaphragm. Here it is around the sac around the heart. It's coating all the main blood vessels going in and, out, in and out of the heart. It goes along the chest wall. You can see this cartoon shows it going between the lobes of the lung. And with this operation called an extra pleural pneumonectomy, you take all that stuff out and most people take out the pericardium and the diaphragm, and then you have to reconstruct those with prosthetic patches. The other option is to do a lung sparing operation where you take out all the detectable disease, but you spare the lung. I, I will say, you know, this is still an area of controversy. We were in the scientific session and one of the other surgeons got on and says that he still does this sometimes. Uh, close to two decades now, certainly at least 15 years. I, I still do this operation, but not for mesothelioma. For mesothelioma, I will always do a lung sparing operation. That's for a number of reasons I'd be happy to discuss during the questions if you want. So I tell my patients there's three things that I will need to know that I'll need to be convinced of uh, before offering surgery as a treatment. First and foremost, it has to make sense from a safety perspective. The patient has to be fit for a really big operation. If this basically, I would consider this a colossal operation, and the patient has to be in good enough shape to tolerate that safely. So safety trumps everything else by a million miles. So that's, that's number one. Number two, it has to make sense from a cancer perspective. And that comes down to the disease as best as we can humanly tell is confined to the one chest cavity, and then again, uh, ideally, it's going to be the epithelioid subtype. And then uh, the bulk of the disease, whether or not lymph nodes are involved, these are all things that 
uh, come into play. And again, it's still a bit of an art form, but those are the things that you, that you need to sort out for it to make sense from a cancer perspective. And then the last thing is that I, I need to be convinced that the patient understands that, that you know, this is not the standard of care. And there is no definitive, what we call level one evidence that surgery is, is, is beneficial for this disease. If you go, there's different roles for surgery in the field of medicine, right? If you go to the emergency room and you have appendicitis, it's gonna be a pretty short conversation. It's gonna be, you can die of appendicitis or you can have surgery because surgery is the only treatment. If you come in with that lung cancer I showed you, I could look you in the eye and tell you, well, we know black and white, if it's a safe option, surgery is your best option. For mesothelioma, we don't have either of those situations. It's still considered technically investigational, but there are patients who seem to been, who do significantly better than you would anticipate without surgery. It's hard to imagine that some of the patients I have would have done as well with just the systemic therapy. Um, but if you understand all that and you still wanna do surgery, then, then sure, yeah, it's the right thing to do. So who has this operation? Well, this is who has this operation. This is, uh, this is the most famous, I've, I've gotten away from it. My wife talked me up, I used to ride a motorcycle. This is, the, uh, this is the most famous picture, motorcycling. This is Raleigh Free. And he's on the Bonneville Salt Flats out in Utah. This is a dried up lake bed. And what they do is they draw this line here. It's three miles long. And this is where a lot of the world land speed records are set. And so this guy, Raleigh Free, and the way they do it is you get a three mile run, they clock you, then you turn around and you get one more try. You go back the other way. So this is a Vincent motorcycle, 150 cc division. It's a little after World War II, I think. And he went out, he was wearing all of his leathers, all of his protective gear. And this is the way he would ride for wind resistance. That's a technique that he, that he used. And he went out and I think the world record at the time was a little over 150 miles an hour and he missed it by like two miles an hour. And understanding that weight would slow him down in order to achieve his goal, he took off all of his leathers. I don't know why he kept his, uh, his helmet on and his sneakers, because he would have looked like a piece of hamburger if he crashed. But uh, just in a Speedo and a helmet, he turned around, and sure enough, he set the world speed record. And that's, that's kind of, you know, the thing that moves me more than anything is courage. That's the human thing. And the patients who end up having this operation are just really courageous because at least with me, they've heard all those things. And they say, you know, I still, this is something I still want to do. I'm willing to incur risk in an effort to achieve the goal of trying to live longer than I would anticipate without, without doing that. And where should it be done? Who should be doing it? Well, this is the team that you want, and it has to be a team. If you just got one person directing this, you're probably in the wrong place. You want to be in a place with mes where mesothelioma is treated by a team of folks. And uh, because again, surgery alone is not the correct modality for this. It has to be combined with other treatments and you want all these folks involved. And also you want someone, uh, you want someone who's done a bunch of these or at least is experienced with this because this is, uh, I've done pretty much all the operations in thoracic surgery. And I would say this is still the most challenging one. These operations, rarely take me less than six hours and uh, they've taken me up to 14 hours. Uh, it takes about half as long to take the lung out as to spare it, but I think it's worth it. And frankly, our results have been better sparing the lung. So um, you really want someone who's you know experienced with this if you're gonna have this done. So in summary, surgery has an accepted role in the diagnosis of mesothelioma. Uh, it can be useful for palliation and especially if you have an effusion, it's been tapped and you're gonna need a, a tube placed, that is an ideal time. That's something that can be done through a half inch incision. You can go in, drain the, all the fluid out, get the biopsies, send them to pathology while the patient's asleep, make sure you have what you need to make a definitive diagnosis, and you can put a tube in a perfect position for the patient. And then surgery is not the standard care treatment for mesothelioma, but it certainly appears beneficial in some highly selected patients. And then the last thing I'd say is patients who undergo therapeutic surgery, they must have it done as part of a multimodal plan. There's got to be other, other treatments included with the surgery, and you want an experienced surgeon who's working with the team. So I'd just like to briefly say some thank yous. I'd like a special thank you to Melissa Culligan. She's the co-director 
with me of the Fox Chase Cancer Center and Temple Mesothelioma Program, which we should be starting. We just started a couple of months ago. We should have that up and running in about a month or two, but we started the Penn Mesothelioma Program, the one in Maryland together. We've been working together, God bless her, for about 20 years. Uh, and then there's literally dozens, if not hundreds of people who, who over the past 25 years have, uh, have been helping me with the research and treatment of, of these patients. So, um, you know, too many to put on a slide, but thank you to all of them. And then a special thanks to my cat, Kevin, who helped me put this uh, talk together. Here I was actually writing a grant, uh, but he was a big help, as you can imagine. <laughs> so these are... Um, if you have any questions, you don't want to ask them, this is my email. Feel free to email me. I'm happy to answer any questions and, and help anyone in any way. So uh, with that, I'd like to conclude. And uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, I, can, my, I, can, I can leave this up if, if people want to write that down or you can pass it out or I can stop sharing screen, whatever you want at this yeah, point. Yeah, you can, you can just leave this up. Uh, let's see if anybody has any questions. Uh, any questions in the room? No questions. Okay, okay, there is a question. Okay, doke. Earlier in your talk, uh, Dr. Freeberg, you, you talked a little bit about sparing the lung as opposed to uh, Can you tell us a little bit about the benefits that uh, you're talking about and why you won't take the lung anymore? I don't think he could hear you. <laughs> so, uh, did I? It was the question why? Why did I switch to lung sparing? Yes. Yes, that was the question. So, yeah. Um, there is, so here's the, here's the lung sac. This is an extra pleural pneumonectomy. And that's when I did my training 25 years ago. That's, that's the operation that we did. Um, the lung sparing is something, frankly, I kind of, the way I do it, I came up with on my own. Uh, the reason I did it, was that, so this disease is primarily caused by asbestos, right? And it's a, I think the average is something like 30 years after exposure. So as, as most, if not all of you know, this is most commonly a disease in the geriatric population. Uh, until recently, I was still seeing patients who were exposed in the military, you know, World War II. So, um, this is this is a cancer in older folks and there is a tremendous difference in quality of life between having a lung and not having a lung we're all born with basically enough reserve to live on one lung but as you get older all of your organs kind of you know they get older with you and so you have much less reserve and so your your ability to dance <laughs> to go on walks, to play golf, to do the things that you enjoy doing, go way down if you have one lung. Uh, it's, just, it's just harder, your breathing is just much harder. And even in a young person, I tell them, <clears throat> operate on a 30 year old with, with, uh, with, with a lung cancer, where the right thing to do is to take the lung out. And I'll tell them, you know, you, you'll always notice this at this point. You could take out one part of the lung, one of the lobes, and you can pretty much get back to where you were. But if you take out a whole lung, it's a significant compromise in quality of life. So it was initially for quality of life that I started doing the same. And what I did, and this is in the 90s, early 2000s, we published this. We took about 30 patients, half of them, I, when I switched over, we compared the last, I think, 14 to the first 14, uh, where I switched from lung sacrificing to lung sparing surgery. And what we found surprisingly was not only did they have a better quality of life, but they were actually living longer. Well, why is that? Um, so the overwhelming likelihood is that you're going to have a recurrence of, of this cancer. It's a tough cancer, as everyone knows, and it's likely to recur after even the most aggressive operations. And your ability to tolerate those additional treatments that are gonna extend your life and give you, frankly, a better quality of life are gonna be better if you have two lungs. I think that's part of it. The other thing is that some of the treatments that we were doing, we think we're probably inciting an immune response. We know that there's microscopic disease still remaining 
And if you're doing something in the chest cavity at the time of surgery, that's going to incite immune response. Well, the lung is a very immunologic organ. If you think about it, you're breathing in dust and particles all the time. There's a lot of lymph nodes, which are part of the immune system inside the lung. And it was our hypothesis. We haven't proven this yet, but basically if you're doing things to kill cancer cells, you're leaving me in the chest cavity and the lung is there to process that information. We think that there may actually be a beneficial effect of the lung being able to help with the immune response to the cancer by virtue of still being there. So for quality of life, for the ability to tolerate additional treatments, if there's a recurrence, and then potentially just for the body's ability to fight the cancer after surgery, all those things seem to be related to having the lung as beneficial compared to not having a lung. Like I said, the operation is more challenging for me to spare the lung, but that's, that's why I've been committed to this and it, it seems to have worked out. And I would just tell you internationally, the, uh, the, trend, is to, uh, the trend is to spare the lung. Uh, not many places are, are doing that much in the way of lung sacrificing surgery, the extra pleurinomenectomies anymore. Any other questions from the room? All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Friedberg. Oh, my pleasure. Have a good day, everyone.